Well, you know, it, it's a pleasure to be here on Mises' birthday, right? He's been my guide my entire career, really. I never stopped learning from him. Uh, then on the 15th anniversary of the Mises Institute Poland, which is a glorious thing, and I don't like saying this, but it is a great relief to be out of the United States. <laughs> it's strange. Um, do you agree? This is my daughter, Margot, by the way, here. here she's joining me from Austria. Do you agree with me it's nice to be away from the United States? This is strange to say, isn't it? It almost feels liberating in a funny way. We have very strange things going on in the United States today. The left is getting crazier by the day, uh, like, um, like, a, like an animal in death throes, you know, just screaming and yelping with more and more insanity. Uh, and in the meantime, we have the rise of, of kind of a nationalism in the US, as in Western Europe, as in many places in the world, as a proposed alternative to the failures of the left socialists, which I think presents its own dangers. And I would like to talk about these two faces of anti-liberalism today in my remarks. So we're going to travel down some dark history of the 20th century as a way of getting to understand what I think is our future. But let me assure you that I am not in any way pessimistic about our future. Uh, in the short term, term, yes, I'm afraid of, that I am, but I look at the technology we have. I, uh, uh, the technology and the, the ideological apparatus that we've been left with by people like Ludwig von Mises, and I see that we have all we need to build a beautiful future of liberalism, of peace and prosperity and universal human rights. We've been waiting for this moment for all of history, and it has finally come to us. We have all the tools that we need, and all of us in this room have been selected and chosen to help lead this revolution in the future. I think we can. I believe that we will. Let us not take this for granted. I was very interested to hear our last speaker say, just in passing, that of course in Venezuela they have Bitcoin as if this is just something we all know. But we didn't know 10 years ago that it would be possible to make magic internet money that belongs to the people and not to governments and not to central banks. We didn't even know it was technologically possible. And now I think in this one world Bitcoin, which is a species, just one of many cryptocurrencies, and it's part of a great technological revolution. I think we have, in this technology, everything we need, I think, essentially, to disable and finally dismantle all the states in the world. I think we can do it. But, <laughs> uh, no. no, we can't. In fact, it's, it's happening. It is happening. I, I, I know that it's happening. It is happening, even now. And it's glorious, but it's, it's also very scary times to be alive because of this angry beast we call the state that will always find new ways to oppress us. Uh, Guido Holzman is uh, my colleague and friend. Is Guido here? No, he didn't come. I'll have to call him on the phone and give him my talk on the, on the phone. Uh, Guido once said to me, he said, you know, the state is a very evil monster. It will um, adopt and adapt to whatever the culture is of a country. Uh, it's a, like this ultimate survivor and will find new excuses and new ways to live no matter what. It's the most important thing to the state that it live and it thrive, always at the expense of the people and never be, uh, be existentially threatened. So it proves to be a very adaptive institution to whatever kind of culture exists in a country. So it takes many forms. In the course of uh, the 20th century, Mises himself saw these many forms. 
and, and he learned, and he grew, and he deepened in his knowledge over the course of his career. Now, one thing you find, uh, how, how many of you in, the, in this room have read at least one book by Ludwig van Mises? Ah, so this is just, right? This is how we do. It's glorious. Let me suggest this. Read it again. <laughs> you learn more the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time. Um, I never quite uh, rise to his level of understanding, no matter which book it is, and when I read it. I first read Theory and History, I think, when I was in college, so maybe I was 21 years old. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I look back at the copy now, and I see where I made all the notes in, in the book, you know, and, and uh, what I realized is that I could only understand the portions of the book that I already understood. You know, it's like a, a new, like a language that you only slightly know. You only understand the words that you know, but you don't understand the words that you don't know. So when I first read Theory and History, I could only understand the passages that I understood, which left out about four-fifths of the book, you know. And I recently, um, actually on my flight on the way here to prepare for this talk, I reread Theory and History. It was like the first time I had read it. I had, it's like I had never seen this book before in my life, never, never picked it up before. I discovered all kinds of things in the book that I had never seen before. For example, that Mises had his own theory of crime and punishment and the purpose of uh, the penal system. I didn't know this. He has his own theory of the origin and purpose of ethics itself, which he drew from Hume. I didn't know this. Uh, uh, I did not understand until recently that basically this book was one long big attack on Hegel. You know, I didn't recall that from the first time I had read it. So I encourage you to, um, to go back and read whatever book you have read and read it again and then continue on uh, reading and understand his, his own works through his life, through the century that he lived because he was always writing in response um, to the circumstances around him, deepening his own understanding of the topic of liberalism, which was the theme that unites his entire work and his life. Um, he lived, as he said, in 1940, um, as a historian of decline, right? So he lived in the age of the total state. Um, and if you believe in God, I think he was put here on earth to chronicle for us the crimes of the state of the 20th century and to give us an alternative so that we can march forward into the 21st century so we don't repeat these crimes. And I think part of our job is to better understand who we are and what we believe and to better understand our enemies. And one way we can do this is by, by traveling with Mises through his century, through his works. Um, and I will give you a quick tour of them, briefly. But remember this. Mises was born in 1881, right? Now, um, I want to speak for a moment as an American. Uh, and what was life like in 1881 in America? Okay. If we wanted to come to Krakow, we did not need a passport. Because there were no such things as passports. There were no such things as central banks. We didn't have one. You could take any job you wanted because we had no regulations on wages or labor. You could become a doctor without a degree. Margo, you'll be glad to hear this, <laughs> right? Um, she's going to be into medical school. Um, you could, in fact, go to any profession you wanted where there were no guilds, uh, no uh, regulations governing our relations with each other. The only thing government did in 1881 in the United States was collect some tariffs, uh, which are taxes, of course, and then uh, spend the money on his friends for internal projects, which is extremely annoying. You could even say criminal, but at least they left the population completely alone. This was the age of liberalism. Liberalism 
freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion. Oh, most amazing. If you made money, you could keep it all. Right? Amazing. If you made any money, you could keep it all. It was all yours. Amazing. Human rights. No slavery. Free trade, with the exception of some tariffs. Um, no central banks. If you wanted to start a bank and make a money, you could make that money. This was the age in which Mises was born. He called it the Belle Epoque, the, the beautiful age, the age of laissez-faire, which he said began at the end of the Napoleonic Wars and ended in the great tragedy of World War I. Mises' first great book was The Theory of Money and Credit, uh, a reconstruction of money, what it was pur its purpose was, and a warning against creating central banks. He said, uh, these central banks, they pretend as if they're going to stabilize the economy and, and get rid of inflation. You watch, if you make one, it will serve the government more than anything else. So we created central banks. And so what did they do with their new power to create money? Very first thing, start a total war. The first great war. Start a world war. That's what the governments did with their great power to print money and destroyed Europe, uh, really essentially destroyed um, civilization and began the age of the total state. The total state which Mises himself defined as a state that knows no limits to its power. It can do anything. Nothing can stop it. And I would suggest to you here today that this is still the age of the total state. Uh, virtually no state in the world knows maybe Liechtenstein is different, but virtually no state has any limits on its power whatsoever. This is what we must reverse. This is what we must destroy. But as I say, Mises learned throughout his life. Uh, he learned ever better what liberalism looked like and what liberalism's enemies, uh, who they were, and what we need to look out for. So in the second part of this talk, I would like to uh, discuss with you very briefly uh, a point that Mises changed his mind on, actually, in the course of his life. And uh, it concerns the topic of nationalism, right? Which is actually an extremely important topic in our time. I never would have imagined 10 years ago we'd be even talking about this subject today of nationalism, the rise of nationalism. It seemed to be a thing of the past. Uh, but now it is back again. And I think it's important to revisit Mises and his thoughts on nationalism because they first emerge um, in 1919, Mises' second great book, Nation, State, and Economy. How many of you read this book? Is this book in Polish yet? Nation, State, and Economy? Is it? Not yet? Not yet. OK. Um, a truly wonderful book written uh, right at the end of the First World War. Um, Mises recommends in this book nationalism as a, a partially, maybe perhaps a way forward as a limitation on state power. A very interesting view. Now, you have to kind of go back to the times. This is a time where the European monarchies had completely collapsed. Multinational states were going away. There needed to be a new uh, way to organize the politics of the world. And Mises thought that you could uh, uh, reduce the size and scope of the state by organizing people along national lines, which by which he meant mostly uh, according to language groups. Yeah? That was Mises' view of uh, what a nation is, as national, uh, was uh, a language group. So what groups you, you spoke, or what language group you spoke, that was your, your natural uh, nation. And uh, now later, Mises completely changed his mind on the subject, because if you, if you go forward to something like 1957 and his book Theory and History, what you discover is that Mises identifies nationalism with statism and racism as all the same thing. So he went through a big change, right, in the course of his life on what nationalism is. And uh, 
Any guesses as to what might have uh, shifted his view on nationalism, right? The rise of, of uh, Hitler in Germany, right? So, um, you know, Mises was living and working in Vienna uh, as a chief economist for the Chamber of Commerce and teaching a Privat Seminar in, at the University of Vienna. Um, at the very time, soon after his 1919 book came out, uh, the great German inflation took place. Uh, 1922, 1923, sent all of Germany into upheaval, destabilized the politics, and eventually led and paved the way for totalitarianism. Uh, not left socialism, not mar the Marxism he had fought so valiantly in his 1922 book, Socialism, which is still, I don't know, one of the great masterpieces of the 20th century. Um, he had not covered in that book, he covered syndicalism, but he did not cover this new thing, which was taking over uh, Western Europe and the United States, and England, in fact, which just goes by a simple name, fascism, right? It's another form of socialism. You could call it right-wing socialism if you wanted to. This is the title of my, uh, my newest book called Right-Wing Collectivism. And it's a form of socialism that does not postulate some sort of universal revolution. It doesn't even recommend the nationalization of property. It doesn't call for the abolition of the family as Marx did or, uh, or even attack people's religion. It said to people, you can have your nation, you can have your, your, your religion, you can keep your property and you can keep your families, provided that all of these institutions serve the great collective whole of the nation under a single leader. Right? This is the essence of what fascism is. And he began to see this rising uh, as even in uh, the late 1920s uh, as a reaction against the, the uh, Marxism. Right? So it's a different form of collectivism, uh, anti-Marxist form of collectivism that's potentially just as dangerous as left socialism, in fact, sometimes even more. Uh, you could even argue that fascism was the most successful political ideology of the 20th century, fascist fascism, which takes many different forms itself. In fact, it has as many forms as, as left socialism. Right socialism has, takes different forms in every, in every country. So Mises saw the rise of, of, uh, of nationalism in Germany, and he's in Austria, um, living and working, uh, terrified about the, the end of liberalism. Uh, every time I, I say these words and I'm chronicling his life, I'm remembering another one of his great books, but uh, liberalism is, of course, translated into Polish, right? Liberalism? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, this is, continues to be my Bible, actually. Like, you should always return to it, read it again and again. Uh, it's hard to say what is his masterpiece, but I would say liberalism is certainly certainly right up there. Uh, but he writes about fascism a little bit in liberalism, warns against it, but he says it could be a good corrective, maybe a temporary corrective to the threat of Marxist socialism, but he warns against it. And sometimes Mises is smeared for his uh, slightly um, naive comments about Mussolini, but you have to remember this is 1927 and Mussolini wasn't yet Mussolini. But by 1934, he looked out his office window and he sees, marching up and down the streets, uh, Austrian youth in Nazi uniforms calling for the annexation of Austria by Germany, shouting death to the Jews, and demanding that liberals be jailed or shot. And he made the very, very difficult decision uh, to pick up his things, pack his things, and take a new job in Geneva, where he knew he could be safe. And he went to the Graduate Institute for International Studies in Geneva as a kind of uh, sanctuary. And uh, uh, God bless the funders and founders of that great institution because they saved his life and the lives of many Jewish intellectuals at that time. And we owe so much to that institution because in 1934 he got there and began um, his work on the great book, the great book called National Economy. It took him five years to write. 
the last year in Geneva, he wrote other papers, uh, other books and things. The book appeared in 1940. Uh, it was an 850-page book in German on pure economic theory, pure economic theory, against Keynes, against socialism, for the free market, for a new scientific form of liberalism. But 1940 was not a good year for German language treatises on free market economics. <laughs> and it did not become a bestseller, I'm sorry to say. Very few were printed, virtually none were purchased, all right? But this is a man who thought always about the long term. So, when the Graduate Institute for International Studies came to him and said, it's time for you to find a new home, in 1940, um, he was 60 years old, and despite the odds, where the US had very strict re uh, immigration restrictions for Jews in particular, Mises somehow managed to get to New York through a perilous journey, actually, and started over his career in the US. At the age of 60, uh, without even really a job, is terrible. But he made some friends. Um, some of the friends were at uh, Yale University Press, and he began to publish again. The first book was uh, Bureaucracy, which is a great book. The second book was an English translation, yeah? Okay. The second book was an English translation of a manuscript he wrote in 1939 in German called In Namen der Stadt, in the name of the state, but in the English uh, version, he called it Omnipotent Government, which I think is now newly in print, right? Okay. Um, if this book is not important to you today. Keep it in mind. I think it will be important to you maybe next year, maybe the next year, for the next five years. We need to read this book. We need to understand this book. Because this book is the one that deconstructs, reconstructs, and ultimately demolishes a nationalist ideology. and right-wing forms of collectivism, right socialism. It's one of his most overlooked books. And here is where he reveals his change of mind about the nationalism question, right? Nationalism. 1919, he says it's uh, maybe a source of liberation, self-determination for all peoples. 1944, nationalism, is uh, really a revival of the anti-liberalism of the Hegelian school. The, the religion of the Prussian state and the Prussian church from the early 19th century was, was nationalism, collectivism, dictatorship, uh, anti-liberalism of a different sort. And Mises wondered where he had gone wrong when he had failed to fully understand what was wrong with nationalism when he wrote his book in 1919. And here he reaches back, and he looks back at liberal history, and he tries to find liberal writings on the subject of nationalism. And he runs into the great French thinker of the 1880s named Ernst Renan. How many, has anyone in this room heard of Ernst Renan? Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, okay. Oh, wow, okay. And another hand in the back. These are smart people. Uh, Mises didn't even know about Ernst Renan in 1919. He discovered him very late. Ernst Renan writes an essay in the 1880s called What is a Nation? And this essay is brilliant, and Mises explains it in his book in Namen der Stadt, in uh, Omnipotent Government. Renan says that nationalism is always made up of some component part, because the word nation doesn't have its own meaning. It's just a symbol. 
but it always reduces to something else. And Renan says there are essentially five forms of nationalism. Oftentimes they're very mixed up. I mean, I live in a country which is increasingly nationalistic, and I can tell you all five of these forms exist there, and they're always mixed up. And they go like this. One is the geographical form. This is our nation. These are, this is the jurisdiction of the state. Everyone who lives here is part of one great collective, a family. That's the nation, geography. Second, dynasty. We share the same history. We have the same forefathers. This makes us all part of the same nation. Do you understand the sense of a, um, a kind of uh, lineage back in time? We all share. Second form of nation. Third form of nationalism, religion. We all share the same faith. People who do not share that faith are not part of our nation. Now you can reduce this more and more, right? You can say, uh, we're all part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. No. Maybe it's just Christian tradition. No. It's got to be Catholics or Protestants. Not even that. What kind of Catholic are you? Are you a modern Catholic or an ancient Catholic? Are you a traditional Catholic, a Tridentine right Catholic, a Novus Ordo Catholic? What kind of Catholic are you? You're a Catholic that follows Pope Pius XIII who lives in a a uh, trailer, or do you the one who follows the folk, fake Pope uh, Francis in Rome? I mean, there are many forms of Catholic, so you can keep reducing this more and more. But nonetheless, religious identity is one form of nationalism. Uh, a fourth kind of nationalism is race. Right? This became very popular in the late 19th century, especially in America. And then later in, in Europe, uh, our real identity traces to our, our genetics and our racial stock, and we can study this scientifically and curate it uh, uh, th through status power, uh, racism. And finally, a form of nationalism that is language. It's the kind that Mises referred to. We speak the same language, therefore we should be part of the same nation. And what Brennan says about all of these forms of nationalism is that they are all inherently coercive because they deny you a choice of association. Who would you like to belong to? Yeah? Who would you like to belong to? And on what basis? And why? Is it up to you? Or is it up to some leader who tells you to whom you belong? All, four, all five forms of nationalism, Brennan says, are contrary to liberalism. He says that there is only one form of nationalism that is compatible with liberalism. It's what he postulates as a sixth form of nationalism, which is, you won't be surprised to hear this, it is where your heart is. What do you love? What does your love cause you to do, to associate with. What, what are your choices in life? With whom would you like to associate? Stemming from your affections. It's OK to have affection for your country. There's nothing wrong with that. But it must be your choice. It's OK for you to love people of your religion in a special way. But you cannot be in a position to force other people into your group if they do not choose to be there. This is the form of nationalism, the only form of nationalism that's compatible with liberal ideology in a Misesian sense. And Mises realizes this in 1944 and recounts this essay by Renan and absolutely and utterly repudiates all forms of other forms of nationalism in the world that existed in 1944 and I would say exists in our time today. And so too, I believe, we must similarly reject all forms of nationalism except this one. Um, one of my favorite American thinkers is a guy uh, by the name of Albert J. Nock, right? And uh, Albert J. Nock had a special love for Portugal. I don't know why. He thought Portugal was the, really the only civilized country in the world. I don't know why. Does anybody know why Portugal? I don't know why. But he said that uh, he considered Portugal his true nation. <laughs> and he said, for the true liberal, 
uh, uh, for the true liberal, your nation is wherever there are people who love liberty, you know? So maybe there's a sense in which the Mises Institutes around the world are the, our, our new nation, right? <laughs> maybe this is the kind of nationalism we should embrace. I don't know. But we need to be a very attentive to, these, uh, to, the, to the dangers of this other form of collectivism in the world. In 1948, Mises was approached about publishing his 1940 book, uh, National Economy in English, uh, a book that became human action. And I think this is also translated into Polish, right? And so it's actually not the German edition that's translated into Polish, but the English edition, uh, human action, right? That's very interesting to me. Um, Mises did not want to do it because he was tired. He was now 68 years old. Um, and the book was, he, he expanded it. It became 900 pages, something like this. And the publisher did not want to publish it because it was just too long and they thought it was too risky and it wouldn't sell. Uh, but somehow, because they, they got Fritz Mocklip to intervene for them and they got uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, bought the first print run, all these things came together. Henry Hazlitt helped edit it. And in 1949, Human Action came out and went to three or four printings. But even then, it, it, even then in 1949, it was very difficult to imagine anyone buying a 900-page book that took on all the prevailing orthodoxies of the economics profession. You know, I mean, it was contrary to Keynes, contrary to socialism, contrary to New Dealism, contrary to everything. And it did not sell as well as it did later. It wasn't really until 1966, when the third edition came out, that this became like a popular and important book. So you think about his life. From 1934, when he left Vienna, when he started the work on this great book, until 1966, there was like a very long period of time when he never could see the fruit of his work. But he never lost heart. He never lost a vision of the kind of world he wanted to see. And he never lost the passion and absolute moral and scientific determination to do everything that he could do to save the world from tyranny. And he died in 1973 without seeing, I don't think, much evidence of progress in his entire life. This is a very sad life, right? A very sad life, but he kept fighting. I think about our own lives sometimes, right? We live in an age of a lot of progress, the decline of poverty in the world, uh, fewer and fewer wars, rise of technology, Bitcoin, so many happy things happening in our lives today. And yet we sit around going, oh no, what are we going to do? Everything is terrible. You know? Mises didn't do that. He continued to fight. I think we need to look back at Mises as an example of how to behave, how to think, how to be serious thinkers, and how to exercise moral determination in our own lives. The big problem I see in the American libertarian movement, um, as it currently stands, is that we've lost a sense of who we are, and we're very tempted to want to always identify with the enemies of our enemies in a political sense. We're always celebrating uh, the person who's attacking the person we hate the most, right? So in the, in the US, uh, the left, left wing is very powerful. Um, it controls the media and the universities. It's very difficult to get a job in the universities in the US today if you're a free market scholar or something like this because the left is growing in power at all these high cultural areas in life. And so many libertarians are today in the US 
tempted to unite around this rise of, rise of populism and nationalism in the US, uh, mostly embodied in, in a guy you might have heard of named Donald Trump, right? But this is very dangerous because Trump-style populism represents exactly that second form of collectivism that Mises spent his life arguing uh, against, and actually very much a victim of it. And we should not do this. We cannot be this way. We cannot allow ourselves to be buffeted from left to right, from labor to Tory, from, from, from one form of socialism to another form of socialism, from, uh, from left collectivism to right collectivism, from uh, universalist uh, communist ideology to nationalist right-wing right populist ideology. None of these things represent liberalism. Liberalism has always represented a third way. And Mises writes this in 1927 in his great book, Liberalism. He says that every political party in the world today represents some special interest. Only liberalism represents the common good of all. And he says that uh, you can recognize true liberalism uh, because it is not characterized by powerful political parties and marches in the street and songs and uniforms and frenzied people uh, 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 yelling and screaming for demands. Rather, genuine liberalism is characterized by rationality, calm, argumentation, clear thought, patience, and moral determination. Right? This is what he says at the very end of this book. And he says that it is these characteristics that will ultimately win the day. I believe that this is true. I don't know if it's true, but it's what I've chosen to believe. Because I think Mises was right on everything else. So I am going to believe that he was right about this. And I want to conclude today with um, an example of how this works. So 10 years ago, next month, 10 years ago next month, a small paper was distributed on a email list uh, subscribed to by a handful of enthusiasts for cryptography. And the author's name was Satoshi Nakamoto. And no one knows who this is, except me. No, I don't really know. But um, maybe I know, I don't know. But it was distributed for free. Anyone could access it and read about this thing this new thing called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer money for the digital age, uh, one, a purely private money that operated outside of governments and outside of uh, central banks, outside of banks completely, it allows essentially everyone to be his or her own banker and to control the money, a money for the whole world, not for one nation, but for the whole world. And in 2010, I got an email September of 2010, saying, and I had heard of Bitcoin by this, by this time already, and I got an email and he says, uh, I think you should look into this technology. And I read it and I couldn't understand, <laughs> I couldn't understand the paper because it was too complicated for me, and I didn't really, there were things in it I didn't, I didn't understand cryptography, there were lots of things I didn't, I didn't understand peer-to-peer -peer networks, I didn't understand disintermediation, the whole thing seemed to me like a, like a trick, because I had seen many attempts to create private monies, and all of them had failed, and I didn't know why this one should succeed. So I have my own email archives, and I sometimes look back at them. And I said, uh, a reply, thank you very much, sent. Okay. Thank you very much. Which is what you say when you don't care about something. Another whole year goes by. And uh, I got another email, this time from a graduate student at MIT. He said, look. I see that you have a new book out on technology. It's called Jetson's World, um, which you should put into Polish, actually. Uh, 
And he said, uh, I think you should look into this Bitcoin thing. So I read it again. This time I understood a little bit more. And I wrote him back. I said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm vaguely interested, but I still don't understand. And so I clicked send, and that was that. By 2012, many people were very frustrated with me because they said, you are the kind of guy who should be smart enough to understand something like this, and yet you seem to be uh, persisting in stupidity. So, um, so some of the founding generation of Bitcoin took me to lunch. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do was eat lunch with a bunch of Bitcoiners. It sounded like the worst thing ever, but they had me surrounded on all sides, and they dragged me into the lunchroom. And I, um, they wanted uh, to give me Bitcoin, but they wanted me to sell something for it. So they, I said, suggested I sell my bow tie. They said, for how much? And I said, well, uh, the price of Bitcoin today is $14. This tie was about $60, but I'll give you a discount. <coughs> $45, send me three Bitcoin. So this is what happened. And I received that day on my phone magic internet money. And my phone buzzed, and I was instantly amazed because I realized that what had happened here was unprecedented in history. We, for the first time, had the ability to bundle up immutable information bits in a single package and port them peer to peer, regardless of geography, to any other person in the world, and it could arrive in perfect shape. And they were immutable and not reproducible. And the number of them were governed by a protocol that you could uh, follow because it's an open source program. And more importantly than that, this beautiful digital technology belonged to no government, to no central bank, and to no central power anywhere in the world. And I saw something that day that really changed the way I look at the world. And what I realized was this, something very important. We can't know for sure how the transformation to liberty will take place. There's no one in this room who knows for sure. All we can do is innovate, be humble, be good learners, be open, be willing to understand and work and gradually watch the world unfold in a way that is compatible with human rights and the kind of true self-determination that Mises wrote about in 1919. I rethought everything at that moment. I thought I knew the path forward. I realized I did not know the path forward. What we're fighting for is an open-ended future that we can construct. Now, you think about how where Bitcoin came from, right? It wasn't from political rallies. It wasn't from a political party. It was from patient, trial and error, and expertise with rationality exactly of the sort that Mises talked about in 1927. The cool use of reason to solve human problems. I see in this technology now infinite possibilities. We don't need any more intermediaries. We don't need central banks. We don't, I'll just say it, we don't need governments. We don't. They set them up, are themselves up as our great intermediaries that would solve all of our problems, make us safe, make us secure, make us prosperous. They have failed utterly and completely. And now we have the technological means to overcome them. If this 1919 book nation, state, and economy ever appears into Polish, you can turn to the passage where Mises talks about the rights of people to secede, to secede from great powers. Who has the right to secede? 
He says, any group or any part of a group that wants to separate from any political power has the right to do so. Then he adds a sentence. If it were technologically possible to do so, this right of secession should be traced all the way back to the individual. If it were technologically possible. Right? This is 1919. 100 years later, my friends, it's possible. We have this possibility now. We have it technologically with cryptocurrency and with, uh, with uh, the cryptographic revolution on the internet. And I think even more importantly now, we have the abilities to secede intellectually. That's ultimately what the Mises Institute in Poland is about. The training of your mind, your spirit, and your heart to detach itself from the prevailing politics of our time, to become a free person all the way through and through, to make your own choices in life, and to be smart, to be wise, be courageous, and build the kind of future that Mises imagined for us. And let's, as we proceed, remember Mises lived a gigantic life, in many ways a heroic life, but in many ways a terrible and terrifying life that became increasingly obscure throughout his time. He did not live in vain, though, because he lives through his works, gifts to us. Every day, we can read them and learn from him. We don't have to live his life. We don't have to think his thoughts. We can let him be our teacher, a teacher for our times and a teacher for all times. His words, and I'm not here to create a cult around Mises, but his words are immortal in a way that he himself uh, was not immortal because he died in 73. But thanks to the Mises Institute uh, here today in Poland, you have access to these words. So you can learn through him, live his life through him. I encourage you to do so. Let me say in closing that when I first got into this business, it was through the inspiration of Ludovic Mises. He was the one who set that spark in my mind and my heart and saw me, uh, helped me see the kind of life I wanted to live and the kind of world I wanted to live in. And I have never lost that. And I think probably this might have happened to some of you in this room, right? Some of you in this room have caught this, this fire, this bug, this desire for human liberty, this, this love in your heart for your own freedom and for the freedom of the world. I believe this is for a reason. There are many people who are not in this room. They have not yet been touched by this message. But you have been. And that is a, both a blessing and also an obligation. In this room, we have all the component parts we need to make for yourselves free lives, to make for this country a free Poland, to build a free Europe, and finally, in our lifetimes, to free the whole world. Thank you very much.